In this video, I'll cover molecular orbital theory. So, um, first of all, let's remind ourselves about what an atomic orbital is. So remember that when we talk about an atom, like a hydrogen atom, that has one proton and one electron, we can draw a cartoon that looks like this. And as we draw more atoms, we can, maybe an atom that has two protons, of two electrons around it like this. And then as the nucleus gets bigger and bigger, we get more shells and so on. And so when we draw atoms, um, we can put the electrons around the nucleus. And then we learned in chapter six that these electrons are in what we call atomic orbitals. And so this idea right here where the, uh, the electrons are kind of like planets and they're orbiting uh, the nucleus and the nucleus is kind of like a, um, the star or the sun in this case. Um, so when we draw it like this, it makes it seem as though these electrons act like planets and they're going in orbits, but they don't actually go in orbits, remember? What actually happens is that the electron exists in an orbital, right? So it kind of looks the same, except instead of drawing the electron kind of on this path around the nucleus, we draw all these little dots. Remember this? And the dots are not supposed to be the line. Sometimes when I draw two dots really fast, it connects them as a line. So um, when you draw lots, uh, when we um, place the dots around the nucleus like this, what we're saying is that the electron could potentially be in any of these different locations around the nucleus. And so th we call this the 1s orbital. Remember this, and then um, as we get more electrons, we have the next orbital, which is slightly bigger, but it's still a sphere. And again, we have the same idea where there's um, electrons the electron likes to spend most of its time next to the nucleus because the nucleus is positive and the electron is negative. But the electron can spend some of its time way out here on the edge of this orbital. Right? So the, the dots are really dense near the nucleus and they're much less dense around the edges. So this is the 2s. And then we've got Remember these guys, the 2p orbitals, and there's three of these. And then we've got the d orbitals. And so on and so on. So the idea is just that um, where the electron is around the nucleus, we can draw a, a shape and we can say that we don't know exactly where the electron is, but we can say that it has a high probability. We can calculate the probability of finding it somewhere within this region. So we have, uh, th that's what an atomic orbital is, is the, um, The region in which there is a high probability of finding the electron. So an, an orbital is a region in which there is a high probability of finding an electron at a certain energy. So if we know the energy of the electron, then we can say, well, it's likely to be in this region, or this region, or this region, or this region, and so on. So that's just a little bit of background about atomic orbitals around one atom with the nucleus in the middle. So now when we think about molecular orbitals, um, we're just talking about 
now a molecule, where instead of having one hydrogen atom, now I have two hydrogen atoms. And this hydrogen atom brings its electron in a 1s orbital. And this hydrogen atom brings its electron in a 1s orbital. Right, and the electron's kind of like this. It's really, the electrons are really dense near the nucleus. They start to become less dense out here on the edges. Same with this one. Most of the electron, the density of the electron in the atomic orbital is very close to the nucleus. There's only one positive charge. And then when these orbitals overlap like this, and the two H atoms come close to each other, the orbitals are going to overlap like this. Um, so when orbitals overlap, there is uh, a region, if this is the energy, and this is the distance between the atoms. Distance between H. Then the energy starts to go down until we reach a point where it's at the lowest. And then it starts to go up exponentially. And so the reason is that as these two H atoms, so here this is H and H. Right, and then at this point, here's H and H. They're getting closer. Right, and then at this point, here's H and H. And then at this point down here, here's H and H. They're at the lowest point. And then up here, if I put them even closer together, up here is like H and H. They're too close together now. And up here, they're like on top of each other. It's kind of hard to hard for me to draw that. They're H and H on top of each other. So as we get these H atoms closer and closer together here, then the energy goes down. So there's a point at which when those H atoms are really, well, not too close together, but not too far away and not too close, then they get to the bottom of this energy well. And we say that that's a stable bond. So these H atoms have some distance that they're going to maintain between them because that's when they're at the lowest. They actually um, are more stable when they're together than they are when they're apart. So H atoms want to make a bond because when they look, when they get closer and closer and closer, they start to go down this energy well until they fall down here and then they make a bond and they get stuck. And so that's a stable bond. It's a stable molecule. So when that happens, I don't have atomic orbitals anymore. Those atomic orbitals mix. And then I have H over here, H over here, and this becomes one sigma. So this is a symbol, a sigma. It kind of looks like um, a six except it's kind of like a six on its side, like this. So a sigma. So these are s orbitals. These are atomic orbitals. And this is a one sigma bonding orbital. This is a molecular orbital, because now I have a molecule. So um, when I now look at where is the electron, where are, now there's two electrons. Where are those electrons likely to be? Well, the electrons now in this bonding orbital, they like to spend most of their time in between the two H's because um, each of the H's is positive and the electrons are negative, right? So there's still some possibility that the electron is going to be out here, not in between the two H's, but you see there's lots of dots in between the two H's. So the electron likes to be around the nucleus when it's just one atom. And when the two atoms come together, the electrons like to spend their time in between the two nuclei because these are negative, and this is positive, and this is positive. So they're kind of stuck in between two positive charges. It's right where they want to be. And coincidentally, that holds these two atoms together. So then the atoms get stuck like this. And so then we make a molecular orbital.
So this is the idea when we're talking about atomic orbitals and molecular orbitals. When two atoms come together, they make a bond, and then their atomic orbitals mix together to make molecular orbitals. Okay, there's different ways to represent a molecule, and now we've looked at a few of these. So in Lewis theory, we represent a molecule by drawing bonding pairs and non-bonding pairs. So this is the simplest kind of model, and this is where we started. And essentially, we just say that each of these bonds contains two electrons, and so the stick is just kind of a representation of the two bonding electrons, uh, and these up here are the non-bonding electrons. So when we consider valence bond theory, um, we can take this one step further and say, well, not only does carbon donate an electron to this bond, but the electron that carbon donates is, S is in an sp2 hybridized atomic orbital. And the electron that hydrogen donates to this bonding pair is in a 1s atomic orbital. So, oops. So we can say, for example, that the hydrogen is spin up, the carbon is spin down, so then they're spin, they'll be spin paired. So we can say, for example, that the hydrogen is spin up and the carbon is spin down. So then there's our spin paired uh, electrons in this um, overlap of valence orbitals. So we can say that in each of these. They're each going to donate one electron. This carbon here donates an electron to oxygen in an sp2 orbital, and oxygen donates one. And then we've got these two unpaired electrons here that are both in hybridized atomic orbitals. And of course, this is the, the sigma bond component of this sigma bond. And we can also draw the pi bond component. So remember that there's also, let me draw this in a different color, there's also an unhybridized p orbital that sits on carbon and an unhybridized p orbital that sits on oxygen. And how do we know that there's an unhybridized p orbital? Because when I look at the, um, the uh, orbital diagram for an sp2 hybridized atom, we see that there are three. We mix an s and two of the p orbitals to make sp2. But then we have an unhybridized p orbital in each case. Whenever I have sp2, I have one unhybridized p orbital. So these orbitals meet edge to edge. These orbitals meet head to head. That's a sigma bond. These green orbitals meet edge to edge. That is a pi bond. Oops, it's not pi. Pi bond. So look, the sigma bond, sigma is the Greek letter for S, and sigma bond is made from sp2 orbitals, so s orbitals. They start with s, sigma. These, this bond, a pi bond, pi is the Greek letter for p, so a pi bond is made from p orbitals. Sigma bond from s orbitals, pi bond from p orbitals. So this is a valence bond theory representation of a molecule. It takes it this a step further. So now we can say explicitly which atomic orbitals are involved in the molecule. So molecular orbital theory now goes even one step further than this. Molecular orbital theory will combine. It says, well, these don't actually, this doesn't stay as an atomic orbital, and this doesn't stay as an atomic orbital. When they overlap like this, they're going to mix. And not only are these going to mix with each other, but they're also going to mix with this one. And they're also going to mix with this one. And they're also going to mix with this one. So valence bond theory and Lewis theory says that these electrons are stuck in this bond. These electrons are stuck in this bond. These electrons are stuck in this bond. Valence bond theory is the same thing. Look, these electrons, they're right here, stuck between these two orbitals. That's where they exist. That's what valence bond theory suggests. So in um, molecular orbital theory, all of these atomic orbitals here that I've left as atomic orbitals, they actually all mix. They're all going to mix together and create a new set of molecular orbitals. So that new set of molecular orbitals is not isolated in t to single atoms existing in between bonds, the new set of molecular orbitals goes around the entire atom, just like we saw here. The molecular orbital is not just in between the two atoms. 
it goes around the entire molecule. So here's our molecular orbital. And when we draw molecular orbitals, they have different shapes depending on the molecule. And we can say that the areas that are red have high electron density next to the oxygen. Look, there's all these electrons up here. So the electrons like to spend their time near oxygen. And the blue areas are where the electrons are being pulled away from. So this representation shows us not only where the atoms are, and not only what their angles are, and not only that we have, can have a, a double bond here, which um, we would have to have more information than just this electrostatic potential map. But basically, we're evolving the theory and saying this is a good start. It's a little bit more complicated than that because we actually have these atomic hybridized orbitals going on. And in fact, it's actually a little bit more complicated than that because these don't exist when a molecule forms. When a molecule forms, all these individual orbitals mix together to make new molecular orbitals. So why do we need this new theory? Why, why create a whole new theory? If Lewis theory was pretty good and valence bond theory is even better, why do we need another theory, molecular orbital theory? So here's a valence bond uh, version. Here's the Lewis structure. Here's the valence bond structure. So in either structure, what we see with um, O2 is that all of the electrons are paired up. So we can put the rest of them in here. I've got a pair in this pi bond, a pair in this sigma bond. So that's 2, 4, 6, 8 for this oxygen. 2, 4, 6, 8 for this oxygen. So all the electrons are paired up and each atom has an octet. However, when I do an experiment like this and I have this really powerful magnet and here's plus and here's minus and it generates this magnetic field in between these two electrodes. And if I have uh, some a cup full of liquid oxygen and I pour liquid oxygen in between these magnets, O2, then the liquid oxygen sticks. It doesn't drop through. So that's saying if, if the liquid oxygen is getting stuck between two magnets, then it must be magnetic. We call this type of magnetism paramagnetic. And why does this matter? Well, O2, according to our structures, does not have any unpaired electrons. But paramagnetic happens when there are unpaired electrons. Unpaired electrons can be affected by a magnetic field, and they can cause that substance to become magnetic when, it's put, uh, when it um, experiences a strong magnetic field. So Lewis theory and valence bond theory fail to explain this idea that where, um, where are these unpaired electrons in these representations? So we need a new theory. We need molecular orbital theory. And so in order to um, explain this idea, where did the unpaired electrons come from in oxygen, we have to create what's called a molecular orbital diagram. So remember we have atomic orbital diagrams, carbon. If this is an energy axis, then I have 1s, 2s, 2p, and so on. Here's my atomic orbital diagram. Now a molecular orbital diagram involves bringing two atomic orbital diagrams together. So if I wanted to draw a molecular orbital for carbon, I would bring two atoms of carbon together. 1s, 2s, 2p, 2p. It's like here are the electrons in this carbon atom, and here are the electrons in this carbon atom, and I'm bringing them together to see what happens when I make a molecular orbital. So if I fill in the electrons on this chart, remember carbon has four valence electrons. So then I would fill them in the same over here when two carbons are coming together. 
And what happens when I mix them? Where do those electrons go? I have two atoms, and I know where the electrons are in the atoms because of these or orbital diagrams. But when I mix them, what happens to the electrons? That's a molecular orbital diagram. So let's see what happens here. All right, so I've got an H atom and an H atom. And they're separate atoms, and I push them together. And I make a bond, H atom, H atom. Here's the overlap. So when two H atoms combine, I have H is just in a 1s orbital. And 1s orbitals can either be positive amplitude or negative amplitude. So positive amplitude is, remember, is when the wave goes up above the uh, zero point. And negative amplitude is when the wave goes down below the zero point. Um, so these are my two versions of 1s. It's either all plus or all minus. So when I combine atomic orbitals, I always have to combine them in phase and out of phase. So here, what happens when I combine an in phase orbital and an out of phase orbital? And what happens when I combine an in phase orbital two in-phase orbitals in the same phase. They could both be red or they could both be blue. It doesn't matter as long as they're in the same phase. So now we have to think about constructive interference and destructive interference. When I bring these two together, I'm going to have, they're going to overlap. These two are going to overlap. And here I have destructive interference, which is going to make the part where they overlap is going to disappear. So I kind of get this shape. Where the part where they overlap is going to disappear. So I draw this, and then I get rid of the middle where they overlap. I just kind of draw it like this. All right, plus, minus. That part destructively interfered, so now it's gone. Here I have constructive interference, so those parts now get bigger. Okay, so. Whenever I bring atomic orbitals together, we're just going to start with the simplest, uh, the simplest version here with two h atoms, two 1s orbitals. Whenever I bring atomic orbitals together to make a bond, to make molecular orbitals, I always have to combine the orbitals in phase and out of phase. They're going to do both because these, um, uh, the orbitals as being a wave, being a standing wave, means that they are oscillating between positive and negative amplitude. They go up, they go down, they go up, they go down, just like a wave, just like a wave on the ocean. So they're going to combine in both of these ways. So when that happens, I get destructive interference when they combine out of phase. And I get constructive interference when they combine in phase. So what does that look like when I have my, here's my energy axis. Here's my 1s electron on hydrogen, and here's another 1s electron on hydrogen. 
So they have to be spin paired. So let's say one of them is spin up and one of them is spin down. So this is how we draw our molecular orbital diagram. When two orbitals mix in phase, they go down in energy. This right here is lower energy than this, than when they're separated. Or I should say this is lower energy than this when they're separated. This is higher energy than this when they're separated. So when I mix in phase, I get this situation down here. And when I mix out of phase, we get this situation up here. So I had two atomic orbitals go into this molecule. One atomic orbital, two atomic orbitals. When I mix two atomic orbitals together, I'm going to get two molecular orbitals. One of them is lower in energy than either of the atomic orbitals. It goes down because they mix together in phase. That's a, a, a beneficial relationship. Sometimes the two atomic orbitals uh, well, every time, because they always mix in phase and out of phase. So they also mix and they create this mo molecular orbital, which is um, experiences destructive interference, where they cancel out in the middle. So the way to finish this now, I have two electrons from atomic orbitals. Here's one electron from this hydrogen and one electron from this hydrogen. Where are they going to go? Which molecular orbital are they going to go in? Well, we still use the same rules that we did when we were drawing atomic orbital diagrams. Hund's rule, which says uh, that we have to have electrons um, be spin paired, and uh, the Aufbau principle, which says that we build up. So if I have two electrons in atomic orbitals, one, two, then where are they going to go? Well, this one's going to go right here. And this one's going to go right here. So here's how we interpret an atomic or a molecular orbital diagram. That's what we just drew here. Molecular orbital diagram. Diagram. So this part here and this part here, these are the atomic orbitals. And this part in the middle, these are the molecular orbitals. So I have atomic orbitals and this one in the middle. These are all of my molecular orbitals. All right, so let's look at a couple of examples from the textbook here. When I have two atomic orbitals, they're going to mix. When they mix out of phase, they make anti-bonding orbitals. They have destructive interference. When they mix in phase, they have constructive interference, and they make bonding orbitals. OK, so here's some examples of what happens when I mix p orbitals. I can put p orbitals together like this, where these two red parts overlap. And when they overlap, we experience constructive interference, and that part gets bigger. And when I make these two overlap here, then they're going to experience destructive interference, and they're going to get smaller. So um, there are various ways that we can combine atomic orbitals to create molecular orbitals. S orbitals, or spherical orbitals, have these two ways of combining, bonding and antibonding, like we drew before. P orbitals can combine in two different ways. P 
orbitals can combine head on like this to make sigma bonds, or p orbitals can combine edge on like this to make pi orbitals. So the same thing, sigma bond like we saw in valence bond theory, and pi bond like we saw in valence bond theory, but now we're just calling them, instead of calling it a pi bond, we're calling it a pi molecular orbital. And these are sigma molecular orbitals. So look what happens. When I have two orbitals that mix in phase and have constructive interference, I get a bonding orbital. We call that sigma. And since this is a sigma bond made from p orbitals, we call it sigma p. And so the x is just indicating that this, sig this p orbital lays on the x-axis, px. So remember, there are three p orbitals. We have px, py, and pz, because one of them is on the x-axis, one of them lies on the y-axis, and one of them lays on the z-axis. So um, when, I ha when they mix in phase, I get a bonding orbital. When they mix out of phase and they experience destructive interference, then I get a sigma star. The star means that they mixed out of phase. So um, this is still a px orbital. So now it's a sigma star, and we also call that antibonding. Antibonding. And you can see why. When two orbitals overlap and I make a bonding orbital, the orbital in between them gets bigger. So the electron can spend its time in between the nuclei, and that, make, that holds the nuclei together. That makes a bond. But if they mix destructively and they get smaller, now there's no region in between the two nuclei where the electrons can exist. So there's nothing to hold those two nuclei together, so they just drift apart. So it's anti-bonding. That breaks a bond. So similarly down here with the p orbitals, we can mix two p orbitals out of phase so that the red part and the blue part overlaps down here and the blue and the red overlap and when that happens those parts are going to destructively interfere and um, I bring the two nuclei together and there's nothing in between them if there is no region of, of orbital in between the nuclei then there's nothing to hold those nuclei together because electrons are like the glue that hold the atoms together so an anti-bonding orbital will break the bond so you can see here, um, this is a pi star. Anti-bonding, because they mixed out a phase, so it's star. And it's not a sigma star, this is a pi bond, because they're meeting edge on, not head on. So we call it pi star. And here are two orbitals that are in phase, combine in phase, so this would be a bonding orbital, a pi bonding orbital. So here's another molecular orbital diagram. This is a diagram for Be2+. So let's draw molecular orbital diagrams for some mo molecules here. So let's draw some molecular orbitals for a couple of molecules here. We'll draw a molecular orbital diagram for H2 and a molecular orbital diagram for He2. So to draw molecular orbital diagrams, let's first draw our energy axis and remind ourselves that anything that's further up is higher in energy, anything that's further down is lower in energy. So we'll draw our 1s orbitals for hydrogen. Hydrogen has a 1s orbital. Remember. If we draw the electron configuration of hydrogen, just to remind ourselves, it's 1s1. Do you remember what's the electron configuration for helium? 1s2. Two electrons in a 1s orbital. All right, so here are my hydrogen atoms. When I mix them, when uh, these two orbitals come together, they're going to combine 
out of phase. I usually draw these dotted lines to show that they're combining, and they're going to combine in phase. So uh, we'll make a pi, or excuse me, a sigma bond, a sigma bonding orbital, and a sigma star antibonding orbital. Where do the electrons go? Well, they're going to fill up the lowest energy orbitals first. There's only two electrons, so they're going to fill up this orbital. Now let's draw the diagram for HE. What, there's still electrons in 1s orbitals, except now I have two, because hydrogen has two electrons in 1s orbitals, according to the electron configuration. So here is what we would have. We'd make a, a sigma bonding orbital and a sigma star antibonding orbital. And now we fill in the electrons. And where are they going to go? Well, two will go down here, and two will go up here, because I'll have two left over. So I have four electrons in atomic orbitals. And when I mix them, I'll have four electrons in molecular orbitals. So H2 is a stable molecule. Stable because only the bonding orbital is filled. But HE2 is unstable. because the antibonding orbital is filled. So H2 is a real molecule that exists. He2 is not a real molecule. There is, H2 He atoms do not come together to make a bond. Why not? Because we would fill up a bonding orbital and an antibonding orbital, so that would make that structure unstable. So um, when we are creating molecular orbital diagrams, I'm basically taking my atomic electron information and trying to figure out where are those electrons going to live now inside the molecule. And we'll give those orbitals names, sigma and sigma star. So um, to determine if a molecule is stable or not, I have to compute what's called the bond order. So the bond order is bonding electrons minus anti-bonding electrons. divided by 2. So let's find the bond order for hydrogen. H2, we see that it has two bonding electrons, zero antibonding electrons. So 2 minus 0 divided by 2 equals 1. So H2 has a bond order of 1. a single bond. Let's calculate the bond order for HE2. HE2 has two bonding electrons and two antibonding electrons. 2 minus 2 over 2 equals 0. No bond. So what this calculation tells us is that it's OK to have anti-bonding electrons as long as I have even more bonding electrons. If I've got more bonding electrons than anti-bonding electrons, 
then those two atoms can be held together and I can calculate whether it's a single bond or a double bond or zero or somewhere in between. So let's look at a couple more examples here. Here is an example of Be2+. So in Be2+, this is a beryllium, a beryllium molecule and beryllium has two electrons in a 2s orbital. So if I have two electrons in a 2s orbital and the So let's go back for a minute and look at this. What would happen if I had He two plus an ion? So this one is neutral. And this one is now an ion. If I have an uh, a cation with a positive charge. To get a positive charge means I'm missing one electron, right? So if I'm missing one electron, let's just remove one of these electrons for a minute. So He2, the neutral molecule, does not exist because I have equal numbers of antibonding and bonding electrons. But what about the, the cation, He2+, plus, that's missing an electron? Is this stable? Well, let's see. Let's calculate the bond order. The bond order for this is uh, two bonding electrons minus one antibonding electron divided by two equals 0 0.5. So it's not a very strong bond, but yes, this is a bond. It's a, a half bond. So He2, the neutral molecule, can't exist because it has equal numbers of bonding and antibonding electrons. But the cation, He2+, plus, that's missing one electron, it is stable. It can exist. It has a very weak bond. But if I calculate the bond order for He2+, plus, then I get a very weak 0 0.5 half bond. So when we calculate the bond order, sometimes we see that uh, there, it's not always single, double, or triple. Sometimes I get a 0.5 bond or a 1.5 bond, which is giving me information that I can't really see with the Lewis structure. So Lewis structures are a great start, but they don't give us all of the information. And when I use uh, molecular orbital theory and create these molecular orbital diagrams, I can get more information about the molecule than I can um, with Lewis theory. So finally, let's go back and try to answer this question. So here's the molecular orbital diagram for oxygen, for O2. This is, if I were to draw the atomic orbital diagram for oxygen, remember oxygen has an uh, electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. So it would look like this, 1s, 2s, 2p. And I draw the electrons in, and the electrons go in um, one at a time in to the lowest uh, orbital, lowest energy orbitals first. So there, there, one, two, three, and then four. So here is how I would draw the electron configuration and an atomic orbital diagram for an oxygen atom. And that's what we see right here. Here is one oxygen atom, atomic orbital. Here's the other oxygen atom atomic orbital and when I bring these two atoms together they make a molecule. So how many atomic orbitals do I have in this molecule? One, two, three, four orbitals on this atom, 
one, two, three, four atomic orbitals on this atom. So my number of atomic orbitals equals number of molecular orbitals. So if we have four atomic orbitals on one oxygen atom and four atomic orbitals on the other oxygen atom, then I should have eight molecular orbitals. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So when I mix eight atomic orbitals, I get eight new molecular orbitals. And what do they look like? Well, this orbital and this orbital, the two s orbitals, they mix in phase to make this one down here, and they mix out of phase to make this one up here, a bonding orbital and an anti-bonding orbital. Now, what happens when I mix together these three p orbitals with these three 2p orbitals? Well, they're going to mix in phase this way, this way, and this way. So the different ways that they're mixing are just, remember, 2px means that they're mixing head on. There's a p orbital mixing head on. And these ones up here are p orbitals mixing edge on. So this one where they meet head on is lower energy. And these two here where they meet edge on are a little bit higher energy, but they're equal to each other. We call those degenerate orbitals. So I'm going to have three orbitals that are bonding orbitals that mix in phase, and then three orbitals that are anti-bonding orbitals that mix out of phase. So now, how do we fill in the electrons? Well, I have two on this atom and two on this atom, a total of four. So I'll put one, two down here, three, four up here. All right, now on this atom, I have one, two, three, four electrons in two p orbitals. One, two, three, four electrons and two p orbitals. So that gives me a total of eight electrons to place. So where do they go? Well, the first two go down here. One, two, and then three, four, and then they pair up. Five, six, seven, eight. They're going to go in unpaired. Remember, Hund's rule says that they go in unpaired first. So, um, we started off by saying, why do we need molecular orbital theory? Well, it's pretty complex. You can see there's a lot going on, but it's also really powerful. We can take the electrons from our atomic orbitals and mix them together to see what kind of bonds and where are those electrons going to be inside of a molecule if I bring these two atoms together. And what this diagram shows me is that in oxygen, in O2, when I bring two oxygen atoms together, two electrons are up here, and they're unpaired electrons, and they exist in a pi star anti-bonding orbital. So we can calculate the, um, the bond order for oxygen, and we can see it down here. How many bonding electrons do we have? Two, four, six, eight. How many anti-bonding electrons? Two, three, four. So eight minus four divided by two is two. It's a double bond. So just like we said in our Lewis structure, it's a double bond. So we come to the same conclusion using molecular orbital theory that this is a double bond, but it gives us this added information that we did not see in valence bond theory, and we did not see this in Lewis theory. There are two unpaired electrons in O2. That makes O2 paramagnetic. So this is the origin of O2's paramagnetism. It comes from these two unpaired electrons in a pi star orbital.